Welcome to the Urban Forestry Radio Show, here on Reality Radio 101. In this radio show and podcast, we learn about fruit trees, permaculture, arboriculture, and so much more. So if you love trees, and especially fruit trees, or if you're interested in living a more sustainable life, then this is the place for you. I'm your host, Susan Poisner of the Fruit Tree Care Training website, OrchardPeople.com. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Some things just go together well. I'm thinking about pancakes and maple syrup or toast and jam, or if you're the healthy type, maybe rice and beans. Well, Frank Sinatra in one of his old classic songs said one of the classic combinations is love and marriage, which he says go together like a horse and carriage. But there's one winning combination that I never knew about, and that's hazelnut trees and truffles. Not the chocolates, but those really pricey mushrooms that are fantastic in risotto and other dishes. In today's episode of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, we'll talk about hazelnut trees. We'll discuss why they've become such a popular crop for growers. And we'll talk about cultivars and how to grow them in your yard or orchard. We'll also talk about truffle inoculated hazelnut trees. My special guest today is Adam Kosial of EarthGen Tree Nursery in Ontario. And Adam is here with me in the studio and he'll tell us everything that we need to know about hazelnut trees and truffles. But before we start chatting, I wanted to tell you about today's prizes. If you email us during the live show with your questions, your comments, or even just to say hi, you could win one of two fantastic prizes. If you live in the United States, you could win a Corona Flex Style Comfort Gel Hand Pruner. And if you're watching me on Facebook Live right now, I'm showing you what it looks like. It's a really fantastic hand pruner. And if you live in Canada, you can win a $50 gift certificate for the purchase of a purchase from EarthGen Nurseries. So that's enough to get you a truffle inoculated hazelnut tree. So pretty great prizes today. Email us now at instudio101 at gmail.com. That's instudio101 at gmail.com. And remember to tell us your first name and where you're writing from. You can also call us today, actually. Um, the line is free. So if you want to call us wherever you live, it's 1-866-905-7325. 1-866-905-7325. And if you want to see us in person and you're listening on the radio, you can also tune into Orchard People's Facebook page and you'll be able to see the Facebook Live video of this show. So let's get ready to dig into the topic today. Adam Koziel, welcome to the studio today. Oh, thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure being here. It's so nice to have you. And I'm really, really excited to learn about hazelnut trees in particular how they can grow so well with truffles, you know, really, really expensive mushroom. How, how did you first get involved in that sort of little joint growing operation? Oh, we were contacted by some Spanish scientists that specialize in truffles uh, that because they know of our root system, the way we grow uh, our regular trees. Uh, we inoculate them with mycorrhiza. And that helps trees grow uh, faster because it produces a symbiotic relationship. And truffles are a mycorrhiza, but a very specialized one. So uh, it just uh, made sense. So what you're saying is basically not only are you getting a benefit, if you get an inoculated tree, y you could be growing truffles at the same time. But are you saying that those truffle uh, little organ microorganisms will actually help your hazelnut tree grow better? Oh, they, they do, and I brought some samples uh, with me to show you. Like we have a 8-foot uh, truffle inoculated hazelnut tree, and the regular hazelnut tree that I brought is only 3 feet. That's so we're, we're saying, well, a good chance that there's going to be truffles on, 
on these inoculated trees. Now, I understand that, uh, first of all, uh, truffles don't in nature necessarily grow in hazelnuts. Am I right? Like in nature, oh, where would we find them growing? They grow in uh, on hazelnuts. It's very common in, in Europe. Uh, they grow on oak trees, uh, sometimes pine trees. Pine trees are another uh, good one as well, I should say. And then uh, you might even get them on birch and beeches and uh, certain uh, other oak trees as well. So if you are actually sort of, whether it's in your backyard, you're growing your your hazelnut tree that's an inoculated, do you have to actually disturb the tree in order to get the mushrooms off to eat? Or <laughs> No, you don't d- disturb the tree, but you're going to probably need a dog or very strong nose and you're going to get right down to the ground and uh, a dog will tell you where it is so you'll dig a little hole and uh, out comes a truffle and it usually grows about two inches to eight inches below the surface but the surface of the ground should be soft that's one of the uh, key ingredients because if it's heavy clay that you, you might have a truffle but it'll be so compact that there's you'll never know that it's there. So does this dog have to be specially trained? Actually, uh, my scientist, we have a scientist that worked on our project last year, and he went out with his dog, and it's a border collie in uh, Simcoe, Ontario, and they found the native truffles in a pine forest. So, but this is not a specially trained dog. Like and you, it's your not dog Rover trained. can do this. It, it, it probably could. It'd be, or if it's mm. not trained, it can be very easily trained because the the fragrance of the truffle is so uh, distinguishable and strong. Now, you started this this venture. You know, uh, in what year? Introducing, or are you just introducing now the inoculated? Well, uh, we started working uh, officially with the truffles last spring. So let's say March 1st, uh, we did an experiment. Uh, we, got, we secured uh, inoculum in Spain because uh, truffle inoculum is the, uh, the most uh, uh, or strongest form of uh, getting the spores because you can get the spores, let's say you throw them in a blender and try it yourself, but it's not, not pure. But we get, you get certified inoculum and we uh, attached it to uh, certain uh, trees like the, tra- the hazelnut, and the English oak. Okay, so you were kind of experimenting it with it the, for the first year. Uh, we are, yeah. And so what happened? Okay, uh, first we followed strict protocol that the scientists required uh, as well. So we had we had special uh, growing media produced for us that was made out of shaved uh, pine bark. Uh, sterilized basically and peat moss so there's nothing in it we didn't want any mushroom spores of any other uh, type interfering with us Uh, we did not even fertilize the trees as well so the the poor truffle trees were basically on their own and that but as we progressed and learned that we say you know what a little bit of fertilizer helps because they need to eat something because just pine bark and peat moss there's nothing in it so Okay, and so what was the result? Did they grow differently than the uninoculated ones? Um, did you see any evidence that it was working? Uh, at first, no, but then we put the roots underneath the microscope, and then there's certain things that you look for. Now, to, uh, let me uh, state that the truffle industry is very secretive, so there's no information out there. So whatever you pick up, you kind of keep under your hat Uh so we went on tours in spain and then you see pictures of a what a truffle mycorrhiza spore looks like and you take a picture of it while it's up there so you kind of bring it back and you compare with what we had and uh and analyzing our data we said well yeah they did here very well so have you had anybody uh you know like a a local farm or anything say yeah we want to try this well, we have quite a few people that, that want to try it, even some celebrities. And oh, really? We'll get into that. Yeah. Oh, too <laughs> so bad. Hey, we want to know this stuff. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. No, people are watching yeah. us very okay, closely. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, the chefs, especially. Oh, okay. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be very big. There's uh, uh, some commodities traders that are watching us as well, and uh, even some other people from uh, Europe and hmm. Italy are watching us and they they want the results and i'm saying well you know we just tried it one year and from what i know uh at the very uh, best 
from the time you inoculate to the time you can get a, a, a truffle, the earliest is two years. Okay. So our, our one, and our trees are really 18 months old now, and this is uh, their second winter and it's uh, the, that they're going to come to. It's also controlled by temperature now. So the, the root temperature has to go down in order to, uh, for the truffle to actually pop out of the mycorrhiza. So here in cold climates, we have an advantage. Is uh, that what you're saying? Like a cold winter will help activate uh, Well, it's a, a cold spring because the truffle we're uh -huh. working on is a burgundy truffle. So their mm. season is really going to be, it could typically it could be from August uh, to the end of uh, November, early December. Okay. Uh, but uh, our weather's been so hot this year. I mean, just... It just changed this week, so there's nothing um, to activate it yet. So I think that it has to be around uh, 10 degrees Celsius or, or below for a few nights. And, that, cause, and the result is just like you see a mushroom just pops up overnight, and that's how quickly they can occur. Really? So yeah. once they settle in, so you, but you said it'll be two years mostly until yeah, you'll see so we're any expected. results. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of the mushrooms, in terms of the hazelnuts, how many years does it take for a, a, a tree? Well, a people to say about seven to eleven years for it to be uh, commercially feasible. But with our system, because we, uh, our trees produce such a uh, massive uh, root system, so most of the biomass is actually in the roots rather than the stem. Uh, even in oaks, we had uh, acorns produced the second year. So at American mm. hazelnuts, we, we ha they start producing the second year. Uh, the hybrid hazelnuts, the third year. And by the fourth year, you know, you're getting a, a, quite a few catkins, and you can actually harvest a few. So your vision is that, you know, eventually people could have e entire farms where they're both harvesting the hazelnuts and they're harvesting the truffles. You get sort of twice the income, I guess. Oh, exactly. Is that the vision? Do you know, has this been done anywhere else before? Uh, dual cropping, they're doing yeah. it in Spain. Okay, uh, with hazelnuts and truffles. With hazelnuts and truffle uh, yeah. as well. I don't know, uh, I think they're doing it in Oregon as well. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, people are, are, are learning the benefits. Exciting. Well, we have a whole load of questions that have just popped in. Sure. So let's start with the end, shall we? The, um, Gary is just going to get me the questions here. Uh, Tara. So Tara, where are you from? Let's see. Tara says, since hazelnuts are wind propagated, how far apart should the plants be along a row and how far should the rows be apart? Could one plant, could one plant them to make a windbreak? Hmm, nice idea. Just along one row, eight feet apart. So I'm going to ask you that question first. Planting distances. Well, ideally, we say uh, the, the, the minimum distance would be 10 feet oh. because uh, the hybrid hazelnuts are about 10, 12 uh, feet tall. And uh, the hazelnut grows, and they need full sun exposure. So if, if the plants and the branches go in between each other, you're not going to have any hazelnuts underneath. So, but it, you want them far enough so you can maximize uh, your distance and, and, and get the hazelnuts on the ends of the, the branches. So you're saying the minimum is 10 feet apart. Now, she, she, one of her thoughts is a windbreak, packing them together maybe a little bit tighter so that you're protecting the rest of your fruit trees. Have well, you, you, you could because hazelnuts are going to grow. You're gonna, and if you want to leave it as a bush, it's going to be a very thick bush nice and very dense. quickly. Yeah. And you're getting the edible And you're going to get nuts as it. well, yeah. Now she says, what are tissue-cultured hazel plants compared to layered versus grafted versus seedling, seedlings? Tara, you got some great questions here. <laughs> so tissue-cultured hazel plants versus layered, grafted, or seedlings. Okay, so uh, tissue culture is, pr uh, is produced in, in the lab. So they take a sliver of the basically the tissue and they root it out uh, in a like a Petri dish. And then they grow out, they get the, the roots, and then they, they grow it out, and then they send it out to the nursery. And then the nursery can uh, either uh, grow it out in containers or they grow it out as a bare root. It, it depends on, on what the systems they have. Layered is uh, where basically you take a branch, and, uh, well, there's different ways of layering, but mm -hmm. the simplest one would be yeah. uh, 
putting it in the ground, and then it produces new roots where the ground is. Mm -hmm. And then you cut it. So basically you're bending your, your branch you're, over, you're burying it. Yeah. And then it will grow a whole new plant. Uh, yeah, and it'll take about two years to get it to root That's out. That's pretty, uh, pretty cheap, you know, it's like it's good if you don't have lots of money. But it's hard for mass production. Hard for mass yeah. production. Okay, so that's what, with her, her question yeah. is, tissue cultured is better for mass production. Yeah. And layered is really good if you're a home grower. Yeah. Uh, do you get grafted hazelnut? Uh, they're ours? trying it, but uh, like you're saying, why? You know, uh, what yeah. we found is... Uh, so let's say you graft uh, an American variety with a European on top, and uh, the hazelnuts tend to sucker a lot. So then you get all these suckers out here, and, and sometimes the stem that comes out is a lot nicer looking. So then the, somebody comes along and cuts off the, the, the grafted part because oh, I it's see. kind of scruffy. So basically, especially if you're growing it as a shrub with multiple, not yeah. rather than a tree, with yeah, multiple branches, why go to that trouble? Exactly. Yeah. So she, her last question is, um, and, and she, you've answered this, what type of propagation works best for a hetero with the possibility of getting some nuts, bearing in mind their wind pollination, and can the hedge be grown by layering? And the answer is yes, if you've got lots of yeah. time. Because yeah. <laughs> if it's two year per two right. years per sprout, you know you could do or, a bunch of sprouts. Exactly. So well, that's it, also, what do you want to do with your your hazelnuts? If it, you're going to have ten or twenty trees, do you really want to get into all these specialized uh, hybrids? Because you need different varieties of hazelnuts mm -hmm. to cross pollinate. Uh, as so well. that's okay. So let's let's talk about. We got loads of questions, but let's talk about that for a second because. For instance, let's say in my community orchard, I have room for one hazelnut, one <laughs> hazelnut bush. Will I get any fruit at all? No, they okay. don't self-pollinate. They do not self-pollinate. So let's say I go to you and I say, there's cultivar. Give me a cultivar name, one of your favorites. Okay, I like Yamhill. Okay, so I say, you like Yamhill. I'm going to get two Yam hills. Give me two yam hills. You're still not going to get hazelnuts. Oh my goodness. Even if I plant them side by side and yep. the wind is blowing, because why? You need a different variety. See, the, uh, they have the, the genes have to be able to cross pollinate. The same variety won't accept each other. Exactly. So, okay, so I come back to you. I say, okay, well, I, I don't have lots of room in my community orchard, but I'll make room for another hazelnut. So I'm going to get Yam Hill. Can I pick any other hazelnut that you would sell? Or that no, it has sells? to be compatible because not all of them are compatible. Those hazelnuts are so fiddly, aren't they? <laughs> they're so, they're like humans, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you want to get married, you can't just pick yeah. anybody off the shelf. Yeah. You've got to pick one you like. So pollination is a really important topic. We're going to go uh, to Paul's question. Now, he's got a multiple question, too. Um, he says, we recently bought one hazelnut tree in a pot. It's about four feet tall at the moment, kind of shrubby. Sounds okay. Uh, we live outside Philadelphia in the northern suburbs. Well, look at what Paul says. I read that you need two trees for proper cross-pollination and production of hazelnuts. Is this true? And we've answered, Paul, yes, it is. But I just got to say, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you'll still have a very nice-looking plant if you plant one by yourself, by itself. Oh, yes. It just won't produce yeah. any fruit. And you can prune it into a tree if you like something You can prune pretty. it into a tree. It's an attractive tree. You just won't get hazelnuts yeah. off of it, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, then he says, uh, what sort of sun exposure does it need to thrive? Full sun. Hazelnuts need full sun. And he says, and will deer eat this tree even without nuts on it? We have many deer. Yep. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry, Paul. We got some bad news for you. So you're going to have to do you now you're going to have to do some, I don't know, fencing or something around your hazelnut cuz the deers are they're going to love it. They'll find it delicious. Okay, let's see. We've got one. Let's do another. How about Alice's? Oh, who we've got. No, Matt's okay, Matt. Matt, we got Matt's question. Where's Matt? Matt says, "I live in a house with a small lot, so I'm hoping to convince my mom to grow a couple of hazelnut trees." And I was wondering how much maintenance is required for the trees. Do they need to be pruned annually? And do they have many pests? That's Matt from Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, they really don't have that many pests, uh, especially if it's going to be in a, in a yard, backyard, because the 
you know, a Japanese beetle is is a nasty little bu- uh, bugger, if I might use that <laughs> term, and that. But uh, yeah. the backyard doesn't really have them if, uh, unless you're in uh, an agricultural area. Uh, they will sucker. So either, you know, kind of use the lawnmower and just go go over them and, or prune them uh, in the fall. Uh, yeah. We like pruning late in the fall. Uh, so you don't get any diseases for, or insects uh, attacking the plant after. Okay. So, and this is if you're growing it as a tree. So here you've got this shrubby bush. bush. I mean, the ones you brought, some of them are bit shrubs and one, one or two is like tree-like. But if you've got a shrub, you're going to remove all the branches except for one. Yep. Let that guy sprout, maybe shorten it a bit. Let that guy sprout and grow it as a tree. As a tree. Yeah. And that's perhaps what, what you might do, Matt. In your garden. Let's just look. Alice has sent an email. Okay. Hi, Susan. This show is very interesting. Thank you, Alice. Does your guest sell to individuals or just wholesalers? And she's listening in Philadelphia. Well, we sell to individuals, but to get one or two trees to Philadelphia, you have to get phytosanitary certificates mm-hmm. and then shipping. Unless you come down and see Niagara Falls and drive by and, and stuff, then <laughs> yeah. But but uh, but yeah, you do because there's a lot of listeners in in yep. Canada as well. So in Canada, you'll sell to everybody, and also Alice, I'm sure there are going to be hazelnut growers or uh, fruit tree nurseries. If Alice, if you go to orchardpeople.com. And you can see um, you or you can Google orchard people dot orchard people fruit tree nurseries. And in one of those fruit tree nurseries in my ebook, they will tell you if they have hazelnuts. OK, Julie has an email. Oh, OK. Julie says, I have a biodiverse orchard with hazelnut trees in Georgian Bluffs, Ontario. Does the type of hazelnut influence whether or not the truffles grow? For example, American hazelnut versus a cross between European and American hazelnut. What a good question. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, no, it won't matter what type of hazelnut it is. Okay, Hmm. so in in this case, we're going to learn how to uh, inoculate an existing orchard as well. So by next year, we'll probably have the process down. So it means that we can probably go out there and inoculate the the growing hazelnuts. That's amazing. So basically, you know, an orchard will, you know, from somewhere in Ontario or Quebec will reach out to you and say, okay, we're ready. Yeah. And you'll come and you'll bring, you know, the inoculum or whatever. Inoculum, yeah. Yeah. And you'll do the work. And within a hopefully a couple of years, hopefully they'll get lots of truffles. That's correct. Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of interest, especially with chefs. Oh, my goodness, to get a, a source of that. I've got um, a qu- Dave here. Dave is from Wisconsin. Oh, this is a good question, too. Do hazelnuts grow wild in the northern U.S.? Yes, they do. It's the American hazelnut. And there's uh, actually it, it can be quite a very tall uh, shrub hmm. uh, as well. So, But the flavor uh is one of the factors that people look at so let's say you know if you're a big chocolate company you want that certain flavor of these uh european based hybrids because they taste better and oregon is 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 producing so many of those but the the problem is uh depends on what climate zone uh, you're in now uh if you're below uh, climate zone five then uh, the better tasting ones. There's nothing really out there. Now you're getting really into, yeah. climate zone five. So basically, yeah. depending if you're in a colder climate, you can grow hazelnuts. They may taste good to you. Yeah. But if you want to sell them to the big companies that make ha- hazelnut spread, they'll say thank you, but no thank you. That's that's correct. Wow, it's that a big. <laughs> I'd like to talk uh, more if you're okay with it. After we're gonna have have a few commercials. And hear from our sponsors. But I'd love to talk more about cultivars and really what the difference is between the ha- different types of hazelnut trees. So is that okay if we talk about that after the break? Sure. Okay. So you're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show on Reality Radio 101, where we talk about fruit trees and food forests, permaculture, and arboriculture. I'm Susan Poisner, the author of the award-winning fruit tree care book, Growing Urban Orchards. We're going to be back after this short break. And if you're uh, watching us on Facebook, why don't you go to realityradio101.com and you can hear the commercials. 
and you can hear the great companies that allow this this show to come on. So, and also if you're listening on Facebook, um, the, the iPhone we have is so small, so I can't necessarily see your comments. So do send your comments to uh, our, our email here in studio101 at gmail.com, and I will be back in just a minute. In healthy soil, there's so much activity going on. Microorganisms thrive, and good bacteria feed on sugars that seep out of plant and tree roots. In return, these bacteria transform nutrients in the soil into fertility that our plants can enjoy. But what if you don't have perfect soil? Those friendly bacteria may not be active, and your plants and trees may not thrive. There is a solution, though. Earth Alive Soil Activator is an organic biofertilizer that contains three carefully selected bacterial strains that will make nutrients in the soil available to your plants. And your plant or tree will thank you with better growth and a better harvest. Earth Alive Soil Activator has been shown to boost yields in crops including avocados, grapes, strawberries, and even guavas. Go to earthalivect.com to learn more about it and let our friendly bacteria bring your growing spaces back to life. If you want your fruit trees to live a long and healthy and productive life, it's essential that you water them properly when they're young. You need to water slowly and deeply so the moisture seeps into your young tree's expanding root system. That sounds easy enough, but you'd be surprised at how often the water you provide for your trees just rolls away, leaving its young roots high and dry. That's why we at TreePans.com have worked with orchards to develop a product that ensures all the water gets to your tree's root system. Our expandable tree pans funnel rain or irrigation water to the drip line of your young trees. Additionally, tree pans eliminate weed growth under the tree canopy, as well as protect your trees from mowers, tractors, and weed whips. Tree pans are used in orchards, city parks, and in residential yards. And once your young tree is established, you can move your tree pans to another young tree. Learn more about tree pans at treepans.com. Looking for a quick, easy to apply, and all natural fertilizer to use in your vegetable and flower gardens or for your fruit trees? Why not work with Mother Nature? Layer Hand Manure is a terrific fertilizer, and this is what Actisol does by transforming the manure from their egg farms into an efficient fertilizer. The manure is dried using a technology that harnesses the heat given off by the hands. No other heat source is needed. Actisol is easy to use, safe for the environment, children, and pets. You can purchase Actisol products at your local garden center or order in bulk. For more information, visit www.acti-sol.ca. Actisol, the mother hen fertilizer. Welcome back to the Urban Forestry Radio Show right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, dial 905-725-1907. Toll free in North America, 1-866-905-7325. Worldwide, 1-866-656-5477. Send us an email right now. Our email address is in studio 101 at gmail.com And now, right back to your host of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, Susan Poisner. Hi there, I'm Susan Poisner. This is the Urban Forestry Radio Show on Reality Radio 101. In this live radio show and podcast, we talk about the better things in life, like fruit trees, food forests, permaculture and arboriculture and thank you so much for tuning in so today on the show we're talking about hazelnut trees and how you can grow them together with truffles and that's not the chocolates but those fancy wonderful expensive mushrooms that cost a fortune and taste great on pasta or in risotto 
So my guest today is Adam Koziol of EarthGen Tree Nursery. Now, in the first part of the show, we chatted about how hazelnut trees and truffles can really be great partners in your yard or on your farm. But how do you know you have the right conditions for growing hazelnut trees? Or what type of cultivars are available? Is there different flavors of hazelnuts? We're going to find that stuff out in just a minute. Now, if you are listening to the show live, either here on Reality Radio 101 or on Facebook Live, I have a special bonus for you. You can win one of two fantastic prizes. I've got here a Corona Flex Style Hand Pruner. That's one of the prizes today. Or, and if you live in the States, you can win this. Now, if you live in Canada, you can win a $50 gift certificate for EarthGen Tree Nursery, and that can cover the cost of a hazelnut tree that's been inoculated with truffles. So, well, the... Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so to enter the contest, you wonder, how do I do this? Just send me an email right now with your question, with a comment, or just to say hi. But remember to send me your first name, and tell me where you're writing from. So Gary in the studio is going to keep track of where people are writing in from. We're going to have two sort of containers at the end of the show, one for Canadian entries and one for American. And we'll, f we'll have an, a Canadian and an American winner today. So that's kind of fun. Send your email to instudio101 at gmail.com. And hey, guys, you can call in today, too, because our guest is in the studio. And that number is 1-866-905-7325. So if you're not shy, then uh, you can call in as well. So Adam, let's, we, we were talking a bit and you, you spoke to me a bit about cultivars. You spoke to me about native hazelnuts versus uh, hybrids. Can you tell me a little bit, what are we talking about here? Are there like three different types of hazelnuts? Are there a hundred different types? Tell me about cultivars. Oh, there's quite a few. Uh, the big thing is being in Canada, we want to have something that can uh, withstand the climate. So the native hazelnut can do that. And the native hazelnut doesn't get the blight. It actually carries the pathogens that give out the blight. So if you bring a European hazelnut and put it beside an American one, chances are it's going to get the Eastern fil Filbert blight. Okay, so what we want to do is you have uh, already some crosses that put the, the qualities of an uh, uh, American, but the flavors of the European, because the European ones are the ones that taste the best. So, okay, you definitely don't want disease problems. You can go for a native plant um, cultivar, but how bad is it going to taste? I mean, is it going to taste bad or just not wonderful? Oh, uh, no, they taste good. They do as taste well good. well in that. But there's connoisseurs out there that have certain standards, right. just like, are you, like your wines. Okay. So if I get a hybrid that is, you know, a mix of one of the tasty, delicious European cultivars together with um, a tough native cultivar, am I guaranteed not to get any pest or disease problems with that plant? Well, there's no guarantee, <laughs> and there's always going to be something, or something new is going to come along. So, but they say there's uh, uh, immune to blight uh, uh, varieties already. So, but, how many? I'm just curious, how many different cultivars do you guys carry at EarthGen? Well, I got about ten different ones. How many do you think there are out there in the world? Oh, I couldn't even tell you. There's so many. The, the, the European ones, jeez, uh, we tried so many in the last 10 years uh, and a lot that did get the, the blight. Used to be the, the Barcelona is the, used to be the favorite one, and that's what Oregon was out there, and that's uh, uh, the one that got the blight as well. But that was the favorite one because it was a really nice large nut. You'd get it in the stores. You still get them as well. So the University of Oregon came out and invented uh, a lot of new ones and they're they're coming out with new ones all the time uh, as well. Uh, even Rutgers is working on on their varieties from from the east coast uh, and then you know we're trying we're playing ourselves with some as well so until we get something uh, working that, that we would like and be acceptable then we'll, we'll start cloning them. 
I see. So you whittled down your cultivars that you're sending. You tried a whole bunch. You picked your 10 favorites, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, what, what was available. Of what was yeah. available. And now you're trying to develop your own special fancy Sure, cultivars. we're letting some crossbreed, <laughs> and then we plant them, and then yeah. we see how they're going to take. And then yeah. so, so with those, we'll cross them even. Uh, Maybe you can make one the Urban Forestry Radio Show Hazelnut. We could have one named after our show. I oh, think exactly. That would be fun. <laughs> well, I also have a scientist. He's from the States, from Arkansas, that wanted to uh, micrograft onto tissue culture. So you have, so it'll be a self pollinating uh, hazelnut. So you have two or three varieties on one plant. Just oh, like well, now that would be terrific. Yeah, especially so. if you're a grower with a small backyard. Exactly. You don't have room for two big 10-foot-wide shrubby trees. Yep. Um, so that would be a nice option. But that doesn't exist yet. Well, we, it's possible. It's uh, possible we're, and we're it could talking, happen. We're talking, yeah. <laughs> so I've got an email here from Tara. Okay. Um, and it looks like, by the way, for Gary's list, Tara is Canadian. Hi again, a follow-up question if I may. Would you be able to suggest cultivars for locations such as Midland, Guelph, Orangeville? And then she asks, could t bare root tissue cultivated truffle inoculated plants be shipped out and survive the transportation in the, those areas? What do you say to Tara? So she's first well, asking about suggested cultivars. Yeah, uh, Midland is... is you be, uh, we're, we, we have a bunch that are, that are going out to Guelph and... Uh, certain areas even north of Alliston and that and so. you can send your your plants across Canada right yeah yeah anywhere yeah. in Canada uh, well BC is a little different because you're not because they had the blight with there so I don't know oh. if the the borders open for shipping into BC okay so we'd be careful there right okay so any of them now are there do you have favorite cultivars that you would suggest for you know Midland Guelph Orangeville or just in terms of is it just pick something that T well, sounds good right to you. now we're we're very limited in our availability. So uh, we're what we're doing is we're rooting cuttings out f for lots. So we're doing some with uh, with seedlings and then tissue culture. So it, it depends. So some varieties we have to root uh, root out uh, the cutting has to, because we don't have any tissue culture in a lot of these, let's say, more northern uh, acceptable areas. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you just don't, you're kind of sold out of everything or? I'm sold out for this year on hazelnut. For this year, but for next spring though. Uh, uh, well, not for spring, for not next for spring. fall. Next fall. That. So we're kind of limited as well. So You know what? And I always say when, you know, I teach people about fruit trees, I always say, you know, order your specialist nursery fruit tree up to six months in advance. And, you know, you're showing that if you want something special, something easier to grow, you have to do your pre-planning. It gives right. you time, by the way, to improve the soil, to do a cover crop, to really get it right. So um, I, I think that's, you know, a great idea. So if, yeah, so that's something people would consider. So give us two of your favorite cultivars in terms of flavor then. Well, in flavor, uh, uh, Yamhill and Jefferson, and then there was the Tonda di Gifoni, uh, which is the center of that chocolate that they use and uh they're growing for us as well and it's not supposed to be in this climate zone so oh. well what happens with our root system is uh because of uh the relationship with the micro and we're talking a regular hazelnut not the truffle one and that uh our trees produce uh a lot of a lot more uh, carbohydrates so they sequester about a thousand times more carbon dioxide than, a, let's say, a bare root tree. But the carbohydrates make it a, a denser tree and uh, thus enabling it to go into winter and when it freezes uh, to withstand uh, the cold because there's more antifreeze being hmm. produced in it. Whereas when you get a southern uh, or a uh, tree from, let's say, Oregon or Washington, it comes out from a, a climate that there really is no winter, and, that, and then it comes into minus 20, and then it's just like a block like of that. ice and it explodes. Right, so. right. Oh, interesting. I got an email here from Gail. Gail, we don't know where you're from, so send us another email. Tell us where you're from. But I love your email. Thank you. You say, just love the show. Very interesting. Who knew? Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. That's lovely. So, okay, there are, like you say, 
dozens, if not hundreds, of cultivars. Um, EarthGen is one place people can look it up, but in specialist fruit tree nurseries, they can Google Orchard People Specialist Fruit Tree Nursery, and they'll get my ebook where I have links to, I think, 50 plus specialist fruit tree nurseries across North America, and some of them have, many of them have nut trees. I should do another one just for nut tree nurseries, <laughs> actually, but I think I do have nut tree nurseries in there. So once you choose the cultivar, how much trouble are are hazelnuts? Like, do you have to, they have to have just the right kind of soil. Is the pH important? Like, how fussy are they? Well, the hazelnuts are extremely hardy and tolerant for, for a lot of things. But the uh, getting back to the soil, that is one of the key things. So a lot of people uh, I've even seen, they started planting. They dug a hole in a cornfield, for example, with the stalks still there. Well, that's not proper uh, prep. The best way is go into your field, have it ripped. So it means just turn the soil over and that. And, or, and if you can let it sit a year at least uh, and let all the debris kind of uh, uh, compost and then soften it. Uh, tilling is very important. And then you put it into a softer ground, then they're, they're going to produce. And that, then your survival rate's going to be a lot better. So with everything you plant, you know, if you ha ta have that extra attention to the soil, you'll just have a better, healthier that, that plant in the long term, right? In the long that's term. Right. Uh, so Gail, you're from Chicago. That's great. So that's great. Um, Okay, now I have some questions here from LaRue in Omaha, Nebraska. I love this. How should somebody plant hazels differently for in town, for attracting wildlife, or for commercial production? What are the different considerations? And myself, as a community orchardist in an urban environment, you know, what are the things we need to think about in terms of should we even be planting hazelnuts? Oh, I, I believe you should be. Uh, you're always going to lose some to some of the wildlife. You know, you're going to get a, <coughs> a blue jay that's going to come down and steal one or two. Uh, a raccoon uh, would like it, maybe even a neighbor. <laughs> you know, you, we have that problem in our orchard, it. yes. Exactly. <laughs> and that. But if you take proper precautions, you should get a, a, a good crop. In terms of precautions, so if you're planting in the city, squirrels are our big problem, right? We have no natural enemies for the squirrels. So could we net? Yes, I would say picture? net. And in, in the city, I would keep it as a tree form. And then you put those cones on the, uh -huh. uh, on the trunk so the little, little guys can't get up. Yes. Oh, you know what? We saw a squirrel in our backyard climb up a sunflower. He went right up the sunflower, got to the top of, with the big heavy heads. He Then him and the sunflower tipped over sideways. They all fell, you know, sort of fell over to the side. And it was such a smart squirrel because he knew he was going to break the sunflower and then he could get the seeds. That's right. So these guys are smart, yeah. unfortunately. So, okay. Um, in the country, we talked about, you know, distance for commercial production. And, and LaRue also asks, what are some good companion plants for hazels, i.e. other bushes, trees, low-lying plants? Do they play well with other creatures, like well, other animal, uh, sorry, other plants? Well, uh, there's people that try uh, lavender, for example, if they want uh, a, a good crop. I mean, I wouldn't plant, let's say, hay, which has a, a lower value and be hard to get into, and it's going to compact the soils. But, uh, yeah, there's crops that, that could be out there, or vegetables, high-yielding vegetables that you clear out uh, every season yep. as well. And even, you know, if it's lavender or if it's, you know, you, you can plant the pollinator plants uh, to attract pollinators. Now, do pollinators do the pollination or is it wind pollination only it, with hazelnuts? It's wind pollinated, okay, huh. but the pollinating tree also produces uh, the hazelnuts as well, so... You know, it's not just a barren tree. Right. And they both cross-pollinate. So, but, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't find a bee or a butterfly <coughs> hanging around your hazelnut? No, typically uh, the pollination starts in late May, early early April. So it's everything uh -huh. still frozen. Unlike an apple tree where uh, or cherries where the blossom comes out and if you get a frost, it kills it. But over here, you get a tiny little flower that comes out in the cold weather and the pollen is just uh, dispersed. Dispersed in the, the wind? In the so wind, so... So we have an email from Steve, and Steve says, Hi, Susan. I love your guest. We are in Orlando, Florida. I'm assuming our climate is perfect for the trees. 
Uh, what do you think? I think it's too hot. Really? Yeah. So these hazelnuts, even though they like full sun, they like a cold winter. They like a. They like some. Uh, yeah, I think it had to go. Uh, well, let's say we'll convert it to Fahrenheit. Maybe twenty-five degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus five or minus seven that I read before for a few weeks. Okay. So so sorry, Steve. I, you guys in Florida, you can plant almost anything. We're jealous of you. So I'm sorry. We have to have one or two things that we can plant that you can't plant. I'm sorry, Steve. You can't have everything. But thank you for emailing. Okay, so Steve is in Florida. I've got also an email. That, or I got this on Facebook from Sarah from Ottawa, Ontario. Sarah says, I've been strugg struggling with Eastern Filbert blight on all of the hazelnuts in my one-third acre urban food forest. And pruning out infected branches just is not working. Is there any advice for managing this disease? Will I lose all my hazelnut shrubs? Uh, I believe you will. Oh. Uh, I basically cut my losses, uh, burn them. And then start over with with what with uh, more hazelnuts or well she, if she you just want more hazelnuts something? but the, get the uh, uh, blight uh, resistant ones right yeah yeah I'm so sorry Sarah if you're listening to the show now Gary in the studio we don't have we can't see any more emails something happened to our screen oh uh, they'll be coming up in one second okay <laughs> okay Gary I was thinking of going to um, a com well, maybe we'll talk a little bit more. I was going to go to our com next commercials, but Gary is busy in the studio. He's doing important <laughs> things. Look at him. Look how important he looks. So I, I just also want, I, I'm just curious about you, actually, Adam. You don't come from a farming background? What's no. your background? How did this uh, all happen? Marketing. How do you get from marketing into being, you know, growing all sorts of trees, hazelnuts, and you grow other trees as well, right? Uh, yeah, we had about 80 varieties. Uh, and, uh, well, the way it came about, I have a friend that's, uh, uh, in the U S army Corps of engineers and wanted to go into, uh, business with me. And he said, let's go grow mahogany trees down in the Caribbean. So, uh, but there would have so been, so obviously <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, his so. job was to, uh, uh, reforest the floodplains of the Mississippi, Missouri areas because the uh, floods come and everything that they plant will always die so they developed uh, some systems of keeping uh, trees alive a lot longer by having them produce thousands of feeder roots and even underwater when there's thousands of feeder roots they still take some oxygen uh, in, in and, and survive. So d d in the end is he in this business with you today or ha he just got you interested in uh, this He idea? got me interested and in so many of uh, this got things uh, kind of went because he went down the different areas he's still like so he's down there doing uh hurricane florence now oh and, boy. and that so they won't let him retire oh my goodness he's <laughs> gonna be a busy guy wow well let's go let's have a, a word from our sponsors how does that how does everybody feel about that i think that would be great if you're watching us on facebook live do open another page on your browser go to realityradio101.com you can listen to a word from our sponsors and these guys are great they are great companies and i'm so glad that they support us you're listening to the urban forestry radio show on reality radio 101 we're going to come back in just a minute with a little bit more about hazelnuts but in the meantime i'm susan poisner from the fruit tree care training website orchardpeople.com and we'll be back to talk more about hazelnut trees after this short break If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes over 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog, we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. 
Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Whiffletree Nursery. Call us today. If you're an arborist, master gardener, or landscaper who's keen to learn fruit tree care skills, check out orchardpeople.com's Certificate in Beginner Fruit Tree Care. Not only does our intensive online training give you the skills you need, but we'll also give you a certificate that you can use to claim continuing education credits from the International Society of Arboriculture and from other professional bodies. Learn more about continuing education at orchardpeople.com by visiting orchardpeople.com slash workshops. Hi, I'm Mark Cullen with some news about a wonderful lineup of garden supplies and garden tools that will absolutely knock your gardening socks off. They're called Mark's Choice, and they're exclusive to home hardware, 1,100 stores coast to coast to coast. Mark's Choice features great quality products that will not only last years, but in some cases will last a lifetime. Look for my various garden gloves, Stainless steel garden tools, stainless steel digging tools, my new garden backhoe, and many, many others. As a matter of fact, there's over 160 different products in the Mark's Choice lineup. I'd love you to try them all, but start by sampling one that appeals to you. Drop by your local home hardware, have a look at the Mark's Choice lineup of tools and garden supplies, including my line of garden soils, and decide for yourself. Great quality lasting quality, and a great gardening experience. That's what I strive for with Mark's Choice. Look for it at Home Hardware. Welcome back to the Urban Forestry Radio Show with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, right back to your host of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, Susan Poisner. You're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show on Reality Radio 101. I'm Susan Poisner, creator of the Fruit Tree Care Training website, OrchardPeople.com, and the author of the Fruit Tree Care book, Growing Urban Orchards. And in this show, we talk about fruit trees, food forests, permaculture, and arboriculture. And today... Our topic is growing hazelnut trees and growing them together with truffles. My guest on the show is Adam Kozial of EarthGen Tree Nursery in Ontario. And if you're listening live, you've got a couple more minutes to enter our contest today. And all you can do, all you have to do is send us an email right now during this live show to say hi or to ask a question. The prizes are a Corona Flex Style Hand Pruner valued at $35 US dollars. Or, if you're in Canada, you are eligible to win a $50 gift certificate from EarthGen Tree Nursery. So, both of them are great options. Send your email now to instudio101 at gmail.com and you could win our prize. And in fact, we've got an email right now from, let's see, Law. Maybe Law? I think that's your name. Hi, Susan. Oh, no, your name is Gigi. Hi, Susan. This is Gigi from Niagara Falls. I would like to ask the question... Why choose burgundy truffle? Is another type of, would another type of type of truffle work as well for a hazelnut tree? Great question. Thank you, Gigi. Why? Well, the burgundy truffle we can harvest uh, throughout October and November and maybe early December. The black truffle is a winter truffle, and it uh, the season starts mid November to mid March, and there's no way we're gonna find any hazelnut, I mean, uh, truffles in Canada in uh, December or, or February or March. Just so because the soil will be frozen and you can't take them solid. out. Yeah, yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, now, are there lots of, I, I, what a great question, Gigi, because I didn't realize there were that many different types of truffles. Are there more oh, than yeah. two? Well, the, the cream of the crop is the Italian white truffle, but it can't grow in this climate. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah, it's very specialized to a certain region and 
in Italy. And have you tasted all these different types of truffles? Oh, the, oh, the black truffle, yes. And, and that, and even the Chinese ones, which are really the low quality one, but the black truffle is amazing. And Where did you have it? In Spain. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I'll give you, because we take the, took this uh, seminar, and uh, after the seminar, they, g- they gave us a truffle to take with us. So... Uh, we took it, go back to our hotel room, and it was in a, a little clamshell blister pack and has a tiny uh, uh, hole in it, so it's supposed to preserve it longer. So we go to a hotel room, and then we went out uh, for dinner with everybody else, and as soon as you get off the elevator coming back, the whole floor just mm. smelled of truffle and that. And then we <laughs> you had to eat them afterwards because it's so powerful. And there were some people from North Carolina that decided to keep theirs, and they shipped them with their luggage back to the States. Everything oh. got confiscated. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they're not allowed to. No, you need special permits. Oh, my stuff. goodness. They lost everything. <laughs> and and how valuable are these truffles? Well, we're talking about the Burgundy truffle, which growers Well, the Burgundy here. truffle is just a little less than... Uh, the black truffle. So but enough to make your spaghetti for yourself and your partner. How well, much would Canadian, that cost? Well, Canadian, let's say a thou- the good one's a thousand dollars a pound. A thousand dollars a pound. Canadian, yeah. Gee, this is a really exciting for growers for sure, commercial growers. Yeah. Um, so Michelle, interesting. Well, Michelle is from NYC. Hi, Susan. Very good information. As you helped me a lot today. Well, that's thanks to my <laughs> wonderful guest. Thanks for the free advice from New York City. Well, thank you, Michelle, for emailing in. Yeah, we've got just a few more minutes. Gary is probably going to put our names in a hat for our contest, but I want to carefully take one of the plants, put it on the table, and I want you to show me how, where exactly we would be finding the truffles. And also, so for people who are watching us on Facebook Live, you can see a little bit about what the leaves of the plants will look like. So we're going to carefully take this plant, bring it out, okay. and Adam knows he's only allowed to talk with his mouth near <laughs> the microphone. So this is a hazelnut tree. It's 18 months old, okay. and this is the root system. Okay, so yes, so we can see when that. When you can see it, oops, it's got thousands of feeder roots. And yes. Tiny little roots, okay? Now the mycorrhiza attaches itself to the root tips, and then when it's ready... It's going to send uh, signals to the, uh, uh, the truffle mycorrhiza. And then at the end of uh, the root tip, you're going to get your mushroom, uh, the truffle, pop so out. So how, how many inches underneath the soil would we find it? Oh, any, well, it can be anywhere from even uh, half an inch to, to 10 inches or, or, or so. It depends on the soil. But uh, w- uh, with proper uh, maintenance, you want to keep the, the soil uh, tilled about four fingers deep. Because you don't want the sun burning the truffles, mm. especially when it comes out. Mm-hmm. So you want to keep them down about three, three inches to, to ten inches. Right. Now, also, uh, now again, I am not that familiar with hazelnuts. We haven't grown them yet in our orchard. Pretty shaped leaves. It's the end of the season. So, oh, look at Gary. Hello, Gary. He's got <laughs> our prizes. But I, I think it's a beautiful shaped leaf. Do they have nice fall color? Uh, no, the American hazelnut gets color. Okay. But uh, the hybrids, uh, not really. Okay, so would you say that with the hybrids, are they ornamental at all when you plant them as well, a shrub? Th- well, there is different ones. There's some that are burgundy as well. Okay. Depends on how much uh, European uh, influence they have. Yeah. So uh, there's there's so many different varieties of them. But, but for color, like a, like a red maple that we have, our native one, no. Right. They're not as prominent. This is a really interesting example. I don't know how old this plant is, but... 18 months. 18 months. So you can see, you can grow it as a shrub where you've got multiple branches and let it sucker. Or you can decide on your trunk and grow it as a tree, pruning off all the other options correctly. Hopefully you know about pruning. And then, so if your tree starts, you could let it have branches at however high you want the branches to come out at right well, like the usually as a tree how many inches or feet until you let it branch well what we like to do, to do is uh, i like telling people the first year uh, or maybe even to the second year let your plant grow normally so uh, it photosynthesizes and most of the energy will go into the roots because the secret is a strong root system uh, and then you'll never really have to worry about its health 
or or vigor uh so th- that's so critical. A lot of people think, well, we we want to get that height, but it, uh, there's no roots to it. You know, you get bad weather conditions, it's dead. Yeah, so basically think of the needs of the tree before your own desires of about its future. Yeah. Okay, let's carefully pull this back, and then we get some prizes. So for those of you who are regular listeners to this show, this is the little container that we usually put our names of our people who send us emails in. Today we have a special hat so now we've got canadians in this little container would you like to decide who wins our canadian prize of the earth gen gift certificate let's see who we've got okay why don't you tell us who has won in canada tara w oh tara you've got your prize is a 50 dollars gift certificate so we're going to send that off to you now let's see who in the U.S. is going to win our prize? Which is, by the way, this beautiful hand printer. Okay, who have we got here? Okay. Can you see that? Uh, is that Michelle B? Michelle B. Michelle B. has the Corona Flex Style pruner, and that is on its way to you. That'll be sent to you. So, guys, oh, my goodness, the show has come to an end. Who knew how quickly it would go? So I'm going to say, we're both going to say goodbye for now. Thank you so much, Adam, for coming on the show. It's been really interesting. We've all learned so much. And that's it for the Urban Forestry Radio Show today. I hope you liked it. If you want to learn more about growing fruit trees, uh, go to orchardpeople.com. If you want to listen to the beginning of this show, go to orchardpeople.com slash podcast, and I'll put up the archived show very soon in a couple of hours. But also on my website, I have a blog, I have free ebooks, and if you're ready to up your game in terms of fruit tree care, I have an online fruit tree care training course. My students include arborists, master gardeners, urban agriculturalists, and home growers. So that's it for today, guys. You've been listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show on Reality Radio 101. I'm Susan Poisner from the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com, and thank you so much for being a listener of this show. I really look forward to digging into a new fruit tree care topic with you guys next month. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show on Reality Radio 101. To learn more about the show and to download the podcast where I cover lots more great topics, you can visit orchardpeople.com slash podcast. The show is broadcast live on the last Tuesday of every month. And each time I have great new guests talking to me about fruit trees, food forests, and arboriculture. If you're interested in learning more about growing your own fruit trees or just about living a more sustainable life, go to orchardpeople.com and sign up for my information-packed monthly newsletter. If you like this show, please do like our Orchard People Facebook page. You can also follow me on Twitter at at @urbanfruittrees. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been wonderful to have you as a listener, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you for listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101.